Welcome to ACCA Strategic Business Leader or SBL. My name is Steve Chen and I'm the fellow member of ACCA. In this course, I'll be taking you through of how to pass the SBL exam in very easy steps. Now, first of all, you have the education book in front of you. The education book is divided into many chapters or sections covering the whole ACCA SBL syllabus. So first of all, for example, the sketch of strategy, which means the introduction to strategy, so which means what businesses should do to achieve their long-term success. And then we'll be moving on to divide strategy into three levels. For example, the corporate level, looking at which industries that you should be in. Any businesses should set their mission statement atop is part of the corporate strategy, if you like. And also we'll be moving on to chapter four, looking at different industries or sectors that businesses may be in, and how we're going to set, for example, the key performance indicators or KPIs to measure managers' performance. And then we'll be detailing the corporate strategy by first of all looking at the company portfolio so, for example, where knowledge you acquire another business in the same sector or entering into a new industry. And, of course, we will have different criteria to assess which approach is good. And that's why we, uh, it will lead us on to the chapter number six, the possible policies towards strategic business unit, or the SBUs. SBUs are simply meaning that uh, different industries or perhaps different geographical locations that the businesses are in. And then moving on to chapter number seven, we'll be looking at the growth strategies of how we can expand our businesses. Uh, and then we'll be moving on to chapter eight, retrenchment strategies. So for example, we're going to be deciding to outsource the business activities rather than employing our own staff to do the job, which means to reduce our capacity is a way to rechange our businesses. We then talk about the chapter number nine is strategic drift, is whereby a business expands itself quite quickly, but sometimes is not aware of the changes in the environmental factor, and that's why the strategy fails. And this is why building a learning organisation is important for many businesses. So after completing all the corporate strategy sections, we'll be moving on to business strategy, which is the second level of strategy of how we're going to compete with our competitors by first of all, reviewing our strategic position by, for example, conducting the SWOT analysis, identifying the strengths and weaknesses of any given businesses. And then we'll be moving on to make our own strategic choices, for example, whether or not we're going to be developing our new markets or the new products. And then we'll be evaluating the strategies using the SFA tests, whether or not the strategy is suitable to the business, whether or not it's feasible, in other words, whether or not we have enough money to do the job, and whether or not it's acceptable from the stakeholders' perspective in terms of risks and rewards. And in this particular exam, exam is very interesting in the chapter number 13, by giving you some of the strategies and asking candidates to evaluate it. And this is why using a POPIT model will be quite important in this particular paper. From the chapter 14 onwards, we'll be looking at or the recapping the corporate governance by introducing the UK Corporate Governance Code by detailing five sections in the UK Corporate Governance Code and by touching the public sector governance of how we're going to manage performance in any given organisations in the public sector, so for example government, so for example uh, the state-owned industries companies, for example. Chapter 21 talks about the integrated report is one of the disclosure requirements to make the information transparent and understandable to investors and other stakeholders. And then chapter 22, although the name is risk management, is part of the corporate governance section here. 
and they will be moving on to audit as well. Yes, it's also part of the corporate governance section. From chapter number 24 onwards, we'll be looking at the finance in planning and decision making, whereby we'll be recapping the knowledge that we've learned from your ACCA studies in your MA or management accounting paper, PM performance management, and even FM financial management. And then talking about the leadership theories, the difference between leadership and management, talking about the innovation and performance excellence of how we're going to use appropriate models to make sure our company is successful. Chapter 27 is quite an important chapter whereby we'll be looking at some of the models and theories of change management, especially as the company is undergoing financial difficulties and how we're going to change it. So, first of all, perhaps we need to have a very good plan and also define a change agent. But how can we do that? Chapter 28, we're looking at the business process we design options. So, in each of the activity in the business, for example, the procurement activities, there will be step one, step two, step three of what to do. And these steps are called business processes. So, in the chapter number 28, we'll be looking at ways that we can redesign the options in there. Uh, we can redesign the business processes in there. We have different options. We're going to evaluate it. We're not as good about Chapter 29, it's all about project management. It's one of the very important chapters in the SBO exam. So in this particular exam, the examiner heavily focuses on the format of the project management. In this case, candidates are required to learn the project initiation document format or the PIT format. So make sure that you can uh, do it. Chapter 30, we'll be looking at how we're going to ensure, again, business success by looking at a particular model in the chapter 30, and then final chapter, chapter number 31, looking at the technology and data analytics. So from my perspective, so for example, the big data, blockchain, these kind of issues would be examined in the chapter 31, but not in the chapter 31 alone. From my experience, that this chapter, chapter number 31, technology and data analytics, is commonly examined together with chapter number 24, financing, planning and decision making, whereby the examiner will give you a scenario. So, for example, the company is considering to invest in a new cloud computing system and then showing you the MPV calculations, these kind of things and to request the comment on from the financial and non-financial perspective of whether or not you should choose the option one or the option two or the option three and so on and so forth. So make sure the chapter 24 knowledge is absolutely sound in the SBO course so that you can achieve very high marks in the SBO exam. So let's see the introduction to the SBO exam. The total marks of the exam, although it's 100, but actually it's 80. So 100 marks will be divided into 80 technical marks and 20 professional marks. So what do I mean by professional marks? It's whereby you need to demonstrate your ability that you understand the commercial parts in the case and then showing your analysis skills so you can easily earn the 20 professional marks. And of course, uh, there will be different requirements in there. So for example, different professional skills, and there will be different steps in there. I'll be touching about that later on. So the exam is four hours. So four hours in total, if you times by 60 minutes per hour, and that will be 2.40 minutes. That's very important. And from my perspective, though, I always require my students to spend at least 
40 minutes, about 40 to 60 minutes to plan your answer. So which means when you, uh, I mean the SBA exam, you will have to sit the SBA exam uh, in front of a computer, it's the computer based exam. And then when you click OK and then launch the exam, and you will see the questions in there. Um, make sure you plan your questions first before you compose your answers in there. Passing mark 50. Okay, so all questions you have to do them all. Okay, how many questions are there? Not sure. Sometimes five questions, sometimes four, sometimes three. So make sure that you're ready for that. And there will be different requirements in each and every question. And of course, in our course, we'll be uh, studying the past examination questions as well. No worries for that. Now let's look at the 20 professional marks. So um, for each and every requirement from the exam, there will be clear guidance of what professional skill is tested in this particular requirement. So there will be five professional skills that you need to be aware of. The communication skills, which means whether or not the format is correct. Commercial acumen, which means whether or not your answer is sensible from the commercial perspective. So from a commercial perspective, actually what we're talking about is whereby the business needs to make money but should not make excessive amounts of money by sacrificing different stakeholders or the environment. And that's why you need to balance the risks and rewards in each and every of your answer to demonstrate that you have business uh, the commercial acumen. Evaluation skills, which means you need to talk about the advantages, disadvantages, and then showing your conclusion, and that's very important. Skepticism, which means you're going to challenge a data given by the examiner, or perhaps the non-financial part. So, for example, uh, in terms of the MPV calculation, we are given about any costs and revenue information in there, but we are not given a tax rate. Although we compute the free cash flows from this project as this, but this may not be correct because, as you see, as you need to demonstrate to the examiner, this information and that information are missing. And therefore, in essence, you are demonstrating your professional scepticism. And then you need to demonstrate your analysis skills, which means you need to show the comparison between financial and non-financial information in a, in a way so you can demonstrate to the examiner, okay, you're giving that information to me, I will analyse it for you. So for example, we are given the total sales revenue of $100 million and then we're going to use that information to compare with the competitor and to say to the examiner, we are better than the competitor, that's called the analysis skills. Analysis skills is not just simply by taking numbers from the case down to your answer, into your answer, no. But to put, your, put the data in your answer and then compare that data with something else. And that's very important, analysis skills. For different questions that you will be asked to act as different in different roles. So, for example, in most questions, uh, you'll be acting as the consultant. So, consultants, for example, in the audit firm, we have the consulting department. And here, acting as the consultant is preparing yourself into a future career, perhaps, in the audit firm, to be acting uh, or working in the consulting department. So, you are in this role to advise your clients of what to do, and that's very important. So sometimes we'll be acting as the financial accountant or management accountant or consultant, external consultant, 
and make sure they're ready for that. Because the question, these requirements may require you to compose or to write a report. So the report format, so for example, the two from day subject, from whom? Not from you, not from a student, but from the consultant. So you need to watch out. And although you can uh, complete the questions from, for example, question 5 and then question 4 and then question 2, question 1, but I highly recommend students to answer questions in order from starting with question number 1. That's very important, okay, because uh, that will save you a lot of troubles, okay, if you answer those questions in order. Make sure, so you plan your answer first, including the answer plan before you write your answer into the answer box. Calculations though, you need to show them in the Excel spreadsheet, and that's very important. Now, how to earn professional marks. Uh, for different professional marks, I've given you some steps in there, and then some of the examples that you can follow, or okay, you can refer to. So for example, if the requirement asks you about the analysis skills, so what you need to do is to take that information and then compare your information and tell the examiner what does that mean. So for example, you may be given many management accounts, for example, the cash flows forecasts, the board minutes, so for example, where not to proceed with the potential investment, or perhaps the customer survey results or the industry research report about the competitors and the market analysis. So what you need to do first of all is to use the numbers to see where not the revenue and costs are increasing or decreasing, and that's what I mean by compar comparison. Or perhaps using the board, mi uh, board minutes uh, to compare the financial and non-financial information, and looking at the customer survey report and tell the examiner whether or not the customer is happy or not by comparing the customer survey result from this year with last period and to see whether or not the result is improving or not. Or perhaps by looking at the industry research report by comparing with our company's performance and to see whether or not we are performing better than the industry or not. So this is the first scale, which is the analysis scale. The second scale is the commercial acumen. So what do I mean by commercial acumen is whether or not your advice, your analysis is reasonable. So from the commercial term. And this is why there will be several steps in there. So for example, you need to demonstrate your business awareness. You need to consider the cost and benefit of each option. And then you're demonstrating your effective judgment. So for example, in this particular industry, for this particular client, the option one will be more sensible because you think what is the most important factor or the decisive factor. So I'd like to give you a very simple example for this. So for example, uh, when we are evaluating different suppliers to choose from, we need to consider a range of options, a range of factors. So for example, the cost, the quality, the lead time, or perhaps the payable days. Okay, you demonstrate your business awareness. You're comparing different factors of these two suppliers, and this is fine. And then you need to demonstrate your commercial acumen. Which suppliers are you going to choose? All right, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be choosing the supplier number two, or the second supplier. The reason is, the decisive factor in this particular industry is the lead time. Because if we produce the product very late, customers not happy, customers not happy, our reputation is damaged, and so on and so forth. So you need to show your insight into this particular requirement, and that's very important. I would say commercial acumen is one of the most difficult skills or uh, it's very difficult for students to demonstrate their commercial acumen in answering exam questions in the SBL. Uh, yeah, although it's quite difficult indeed, but we're showing to the examiner, we've analysed things, and then we pick out 
what would be the most important things to consider, and that's how we show or demonstrate our commercial acumen ability. The first skill is communication skills. So what do I mean by communication? It's all about format. Uh, so you need to get the format right and you will get all the marks in the communication skills. Although in the steps, you need to understand the audience level of understanding. And from my perspective, you are sitting in this exam paper and you are, your audience is the examiner or marker. So uh, although in theory, the second point is important, but in practice it's not very important because if you get the formats right, and it will give you the communication skills marks. And of course, number three should be made in a logical and progressive order, but not very important from this exam's point of view because we are only having four hours and it's very difficult to make this into a logical and progressive order. But just make sure that you use the information from the case and that will be, be fine. There'll be different uh, communication skills, formats required in this exam. If you're writing a letter, emails, memos, briefing notes, briefing papers, working notes, and even the report, you can use this format. Two, to whom, for example, to the board, you need to watch out in every question requirement. From whom, perhaps the external consultant, perhaps the financial manager, you need to watch out the role stated or required by the examiner. And the date, you will say that this will be the exam date. Just input the words exam date will be fine. And then your subjects, okay, very important in there. Uh, the subjects, uh, you can uh, pick out the keywords from the requirements. So for example, the requirements may say, assess the strategic impact onto the business uh, from these two options. So the subject, you can say strategic impact. Okay. And then you can say dear, dear whom, so for example, dear board, okay, as the introduction paragraph. And then finally, you'll have sincerely or best wishes or regards and the name of the author. You don't have to put your name in there. So for example, your name is Steve Chen and you don't put your name as a Steve Chen, you put your name as the consultant. The reports, uh, two from, and you can follow two from day subject, absolutely fine, two from day subject, and the introduction, the main body of the report, uh, please do make sure they use subheadings. And then finally, showing your conclusion in the bottom. You may be asked to provide slides, and you put your headings as the slide header and then putting your explanation in the notes page okay, as different paragraphs to support different points that you're making. That's very important. Sometimes you're asked about, for example, the Mendelo's uh, mapping matrix by categorizing different stakeholders and how we're going to treat them. Although we are given the chart here, but in the exam, we never use this. So in the exam, you say to the examiner, okay, we've got the first type of stakeholder, it's called customer. And I think their power is high. Okay. And then their interest is also very high. And they will explain why, and that'll be fine. So if we categorize that using words, for different types of uh, stakeholders, or perhaps we are asked about the business process, re business process re design options by using the Harman's matrix. As long as we categorize different stakeholders or different processes in the correct place, and that will be fine. We don't have to use the picture here. So sometimes you'll need to 
compose a press release and telling the media what you have done and what you are go going to do. So here, you to tell the examiner or in the press release, you say, not from the first party, third party's perspective, it's from our company, okay, we will do this, we will do that. And I will not say the company will do this and company will do that. No, we will do this and we will do that and so on and so forth. So make sure you get this right. And of course, you have factual paragraphs and of course in our answer we'll be having factual paragraphs in, in, in all formats. So report, press release and so on and so forth because of the time pressure. And you will also see uh, there will be a press release headings and then there will be the ending paragraph and then contact information. So for example, contact me, uh, but I'll not put my name in, that, in, in, in there. Another very important format from the exam's point of view is the project initiation document or the PID format. You need to learn these things, okay? otherwise you will lose substantial marks in this particular requirement. Tell the examiner, if the examiner requires you to prepare the pit, it just states the project goals of what you're going to be achieving and what will be affected, the scope of the project, and then which organisation, and then the business case showing the financial and non-financial benefit of uh, doing the project. And the constraints in place in terms of the time or budget, the stakeholders involved in the project, and the risks involved in a project, for example, it may cause a bit delay. And project controls, so for example, in terms of the reporting uh, controls, for example, report to whom, uh, and then who is going to approve further budget to the project. The reporting framework of what we're trying to report and when, and then to sign off by whom, and then finally, give a summary for that. The next scale is the evaluation scale. So evalu evaluate things, which means to balance the advantages and disadvantages, or advantages are sometimes called benefit, disadvantages are sometimes called risks. So in our answer, we'll have to demonstrate to the examiner the comparison stuff so which means the financial and non-financial parts and finally make a recommendation. It should be a sensible recommendation. So for example, an example here is write a business case to a board to evaluate whether or not we should invest in a new IT system. So first of all then, step number one is to see what are the problems in the current situation. In the current situation, there's a problem in the IT system and that's why we're going to be updating with the new one. For example, it's quite slow in processing information. And then we'll tell the examiner, if we invest in a new system, what are those benefits? For example, it can be quicker to process the information. And then we'll also balance the downside bit of investing in a new system. So for example, the risk that the information system may be hacked by somebody else and finally we'll be making a decision of what to do. So for example, whether or not you're going to be proceeding with the investment or not. Number five, scepticism professional skill. So the steps in there is whereby we're going to be politely challenge the information given by the examiner. So you need to do this in a polite way. So you to see whether or not there will be sufficient evidence to support the claim. So for example, if the information about the MPV analysis is not enough, what further evidence or what further information is needed? So if you challenge it, so for example, the tax rate may be needed, the tax rate may be updated, the cash flows forecast are not done by considering the time value of money effect. So that's why we can also consider the weighted average cost of capital as the discount factor to make 
the project appraisal more accurate. So do this in a very polite way and stating the facts and this will be fine. A courteous way if you like. So just to sum up what we have done so far by introducing the SBL course uh, or the SBO exam. The four hours I'll be dividing into 40 and 200 minutes. I will then use 200 minutes and to divide into 80 technical marks. I will allocate 2.5 minutes per mark. And I will be first of all spending 40 minutes to read a question and then plan the answer before I write my answer into the actual question. The writing tips, and uh, I, I would recommend my students for each point they're going to make, the maximum number of sentences for each point is four, but I would highly recommend students to provide short paragraphs, which means in each paragraph you need to include two sentences, and this will be absolutely fine. And they're going to leave the space by enter, by clicking the enter in your keyboard uh, for each paragraph that you've made. So one nice space, that's very important. And also use headings or subheadings with bold format or italic format and underlying it so where possible. And then do not describe models. Okay? Do not tell the examiner, okay, I'll be analysing using the Porter's Five Forces model, and this will be fine. And then, uh, using the Porter's Five Forces model, uh, what do I mean by customer? What do I mean by competitor? You don't need to define them. So general answer in this particular examination will not give you any marks, and that's very important, because this is a professional exam. It's all about applying your knowledge into the practical case. There will be some verbs commonly seen in your exam. So, for example, analyse things is whereby you have to explain something. So, for example, utilising the information, especially the financial information in the case. Assessing, informa uh, assessing things, which means to evaluate things. Talk about the, uh, the upside and downside. Comparing things, uh, which means we're going to show the similarity and... and uh, differences among different options. Conclusion recommendation in the end needs to be making sense. Criticize something by focusing on the weaknesses in the answer or in the information. Evaluating things same as the assessing things. Interpret things same as analyzing things which means we're going to utilize the information from the case. Outline uh, is not commonly seen in this particular exam but if you can see outline part, uh, the examiner is testing you about the theory stuff and make sure to get this right. Summarizing things, okay, you're, you're going to be making a conclusion. So critically, uh, to evaluate something, which means to be more careful to watch out what information is missing and what information is wrong in the case. So. These are verbs that you can commonly see in the SBO exam. Okay, this ends with our first section uh, for the introduction to the SBO exam. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye. A P C accounting for your future.